Um, this next session um, is about just transitions because as we were hearing the earlier session uh, and uh, uh, from many of our panelists there, it's incredibly important that everyone is included in this journey um, for reasons of equity that nobody is left behind. But um, I come at this from um, these challenges are so great. Uh, we need everybody's um, energy and engagement on it and their ideas and their creativity. Otherwise, we're not going to do this. So that's why uh, I think it's also hugely important for um, that inclusivity. We've got a great panel session on this subject. And as our keynote speaker before the, um, we go into the panel, it's my great pleasure to welcome Alana Dave, who is... Um, the, the Urban Transport Officer with the International Transport Workers Federation. Originally from South Africa, now based in that job um, in London, and very involved uh, with C40 and um, various other organizations like Sustainability, uh, Sustainable Mobility for All um, on these issues. So um, you've come a very long way, um, Lana. Thank you for coming. Um, and all that distance for only 15 minutes and then the panel session. I mean, this is pretty crazy, like 50, 25 hours of flying for 15 minutes. No, there's a bigger contribution than that. A very big hand for Alana, please. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Um, before I start, on behalf of the 20 million transport workers, from 147 countries that my organization represents. We stand in solidarity with you as the New Zealand people as you process and come to terms with the shocking massacre in Christchurch. On a more personal note, I come from South Africa with a long and brutal history of white supremacy. So I feel deeply your sadness, your trauma, your anger, but also your determination to resist racism and xenophobia. I'm very pleased today to be introducing the topic of just transition to help frame the discussion on the panel this afternoon. As the slide shows, these are photos of transport workers from around the world on a day of action showing what issues they care about in the just transition in transport. I'm going to be looking at a few examples of how just transition is being addressed globally and draw out some of the key issues and questions which could assist your discussions here in Auckland. Just transition, as you can see from this slide, is a key requirement now of the Paris Agreement. It says that the national climate action plans of countries must take into account the imperatives of just transition for the workforce and the creation of decent work and quality jobs. To be honest with you, the call for just transition until pretty recently, has only now become more widespread. Until recently, it was mainly a campaigning priority for civil society organizations, environmental organizations, and the international trade union movement. But now it features much more prominently in national and local politics and policy. I think convening panels like this shows that there is recognition by the decision makers here in Auckland that the transition to a low carbon economy has to be fair, equitable, and inclusive. And many speakers this morning emphasized that. But I think the challenge is that just transition is not inevitable, even if we hold it up as a really worthy principle. Every flagship action has to incorporate just transition policies to make sure that that transition is fair. But I want, us, I want to challenge all of us in the room 
to think about what do we mean by just transi transition? And does the meaning we give to just transition depend on whose rights and interests we are representing? I think we heard from the previous speaker on food systems that we could have very different understandings of the scale and nature of the changes necessary to transform our economies away from fossil fuels. What I wanted to contribute to the discussion, at the minimum, just transition is about those measures that need to be taken to reduce the impact of jobs and livelihood losses as a result of industry phase out on workers and communities. But it must also include measures to produce new low emission climate jobs as well as healthy communities. The ILO many of you might be familiar with. It's a body of the United Nations which brings together employers, worker representatives, as well as governments to develop global labor standards. And the ILO produced guidelines to influence the Paris negotiations. And I thought it would be useful to highlight a few key elements of these guidelines for our discussion. The guidelines say that the greening of economies present an opportunity to achieve social objectives and reduce social inequalities, mainly through the creation of decent jobs. The policies towards a low emission economy must promote principles and rights at work, gender equality by taking into account the gender dimension of all policies, and governments must promote cooperation and participation and provide opportunities for stakeholders to participate at all levels, whether it's national, local, regional, or sectoral. And that collaboration must lead to the incorporation of just transition policies in national and climate city action plans. The last point there shows that a just transition framework must anticipate impacts on employment, provide adequate social protection for where there are job losses and displacement, develop skills and promote social dialogue with trade unions who represent the interests of the workforce. I want to share this slide with you. It comes from a report that I will speak about um, later in my presentation, but which I think provides a very nice summary of the key principles of just transition, including respect for workers and communities, worker participation at every level of the transition, transitioning to good jobs, healthy communities, planning for the future but grounded in the realities that we're working with today, the link between national, regional and local, and immediate but long-term sustainable support. Actually, I'm going to go back and keep it there. So I think these are very significant and important building blocks for just transition. But if we look at the synopsis for this session, it goes further and challenges us with a statement, new products, services, and ways of working will be required as will changes to institutional and systemic structures to enable the transition. I think this suggests that just transition could be about much deeper systemic changes rooted in the dynamics of sustainability, based on very different forms of production and consumption, like the previous speaker on food systems alluded to. So in this sense, the ecological crisis or emergency, like we discussed this morning, presents us with an opportunity to not only change 
and address employment issues in our society, but also to consider how resources are redistributed and how the public good is pursued, including the guaranteeing of gender equality and intergenerational equality. So on the issue of intergenerational justice, which is one of the themes on the panel, I would like to share the words that were shared with me of a young public transport worker in one of our trade unions. He said, even short-term investment in public transport will create tens of thousands of jobs. This is really important because for decades, young workers have faced challenges in the labor market. Many young people who have work are underemployed or working in temporary short-term positions. So we want to be involved in a sector where there is high employment potential. But it's not only the quantity, but quality of jobs which also matter. We want decent jobs with organizational and employment rights. We share this goal with young workers everywhere there are about 73 million young people who are unemployed. 42% of economically active youth are still either unemployed or working yet living in poverty. That was his statement, which I think is very powerful. And to rise to this challenge, I think there are deeper questions about just transition which we need to be asking ourselves in this forum. What kind of growth, what kind of economic growth are we promoting in cities? Is it more finite, is it, sorry, is it more compatible with the finite resources of the planet? Are we taking investment decisions based on the long-term collective benefits, including a better quality of life for young people and women? Does this growth guarantee more decent jobs and jobs that both men and women have equal access to? And what kind of democracy is needed to advance sustainability? I really want to emphasize, which I think came out of the sessions this morning, the importance of planning and cooperation. I think if we're going to address the climate crisis seriously, this will require levels of cooperation and sharing of knowledge on a massive scale. And this will need to be done locally, but also internationally. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change said that effective mitigation will not be achieved if individual agents advance their own interests independently. And I think in a city like Auckland, we can engage in transformational sector-by-sector -sector work. We can show what needs to be done. And I suppose, what does this mean concretely in a city like Auckland? And I want to talk about the public transport sector to highlight some of these principles of just transition. Firstly, the unions that we represent in this city applaud the signing of the C40 fossil fuel streets agreement by the Auckland City Council and the massive investment in public transport infrastructure. They also completely support the consultation into the Auckland Climate Action Plan. And of course, they support, as we heard from a previous speaker, the need to triple the size of public transport in the city. And unions are supporting this because their members are the people who are affected on a daily basis. They are the workers who operate the public transport system. They have the knowledge and skills to contribute. For example, bus drivers have vital insight into how the network <coughs> operates. But, Workers need a forum and space to share these insights. I would argue that a just transition in public transport in Auckland would promote a culture of inclusion and collaboration between the city, 
and trade unions, who should be part of the um, decision-making process about infrastructure, about operations, about health and safety, because their members are directly impacted. And I can say confidently, with workers on board, the political momentum that is needed to achieve the urgent and scale of change that we need is much more likely. I can also say that the outcomes of just transition will benefit both the workforce and community by improving the services for everyone. So by improving terms and conditions of employment, there will be higher rates of driver retention. And more drivers improve safety, which is good for the workforce, as well as for passengers. But just going back to the beginning of my speech, where I spoke about the need for transformative change, if we are going to promote just transition and decent work in public transport, questions need to be asked about whether the current public transport operating model is able to deliver these outcomes. And if not, how you can develop a model of public transport which includes and values everyone and is developed in the interests of the people. Now, I know some of this might seem overwhelming and some of you might be thinking it's unrealistic. But I just quickly want to look at, in the two minutes that I've got left, some of what's been done internationally to advance these principles. In Canada, there's a clean growth and climate action plan which commits to the phasing out of coal-fired electricity. As part of the implementation of this plan, the Minister of Climate Change set up a task force for Canadian coal power workers and communities. Members of the task force are from local authorities, they're experts, they're from unions, and they released their report two days ago, which I would encourage all of you to go and look at, with 10 recommendations on how to support workers as a result of the phase out. In Oslo, in Norway, a just transition council has been set up to build collective knowledge and advise the city council on issues such as the labor impacts of climate change policies. Again, the council is composed of elected representatives from municipalities, from trade unions, as well as from business associations. In a city like Nairobi in Kenya, the city is expanding its public transport, but until recently, workers and trade unions were excluded, which resulted in rejection of some of the changes. As a result of trade union campaigning and a labor impact assessment, we recently received that recognition from the Minister of Transport that there will be a just transition for workers who are impacted by the changes. The international trade union movement has a just transition center, which is building the capacities, the skills, and the ideas amongst trade unions to contribute to this process. And my organization has a global program promoting the expansion of public transport, including an agreement with the UITP, and I know Auckland Transport is a member of the UITP and other public transport companies in New Zealand and Auckland, on climate leadership, recognizing that employers as well as employees are actors. And very quickly, this is an agreement signed by Auckland. Our organization of trade unions has supported the green and healthy streets calling on cities to build partnerships with unions to integrate just transition plans driving decent work. We call on cities to build partnerships to deliver just transition on zero emission buses, including workers' training. And we ask cities to look at how they can mobilize the workers' knowledge and skills to 
contribute to the process of planning and actions. And very quickly, I won't go through this, but the trade union movement here in New Zealand has their own 10-point plan for just transition, which if implemented with governments at national and local level and with employers, will go a far way to driving the climate action plans of the country and cities. So I just want to conclude by repeating the words of Sam Huggard, the General Secretary of the NZCTU, because what he says is true for New Zealand, but it's also true for countries everywhere. We have a moment of opportunity right now for a democratic process to decide how we meet the challenge of climate change. Working people will all be directly or indirectly impacted by the necessary transition. How we share the costs and benefits of these changes is the conversation we urgently need to have. And that's the conversation that we're going to be having on the panel. So thank you. Um, thank you very much indeed, Alana, for um, setting that really important context about just transitions and giving us that perspective of how um, the union movement in general, um, but in particular transport uh, workers, are playing a really crucial role in that. Now, there is a panel discussion. It's going to be led by um, the youngest councillor um, on the um, uh, Auckland Council, uh, Richard Hills, um, a bit too old to be Rangatahi, perhaps, but that's quite all right. And um, so I'm just going to welcome up Richard, who's then going to organise the panel. Um, a very big hand for Richard, please. Thanks. Thank you, Rod. Um, kia ora. Ina whānau, ina rau rangatirama, tēnā koutou katoa. Ko Nāpuhi tuku iwi, ko Taratara te maunga. Ko Whangaroa te awa, no Glenfield aho. Ko Richard Hills toko ingoa, ki raki pai whenua aho e noho ana. Hi kai kaunahira aho, mo te kaunahira o Tāmaki Makoto. Tana koutou katoa. Um, thank you all for being here and um, thank you for the, the, the team for asking me to chair this panel as the youngest councillor, but at 32 I'm not young anymore, but I'm happy to often sometimes be the youngest person in the room. Um, so um, that's great. But also just um, obviously the, the sad, um, horrible, white um, supremacist terrorism that happened in our country on Friday. Just want to thank our community, but generally, um, you know, everyone here, it's great to be in a room full of people who care about stuff. Um, but also that, you know, I don't, I wasn't fearful. People who look like me and atheists weren't actually in any um, risk on Friday. It was other, uh, another section of our community. So I think it's important for people who look like me to clean house a bit and make sure that people who look like me aren't creating more harm across our communities. So big thoughts out to our Muslim community in Christchurch and um, everyone else affected. So thank you so much and thank you for being here um, doing good mahi for New Zealand and the world. Thank you. Um, so I'll just invite our panel up, and then we'll have some good discussions. Hello, hello. Cool. I'll just get our panel to introduce themselves um, and what, you're, what you do in your lives and why you're here. Thank you. Uh, kia ora, everyone. Uh, malale. My name is Vicinia Maka. I'm uh, the chairperson of Auckland's Youth Advisory Panel. Um, I'm 21 years old and I attend the University of Auckland. Um, it's quite strange to be a part of this panel. Um, I'm quite uh, nervous um, as well as... Um, this experience is quite daunting, being the youngest person on this panel, so panel as well. Uh, but yeah, no, it's exciting to be here. I'm really excited to be a part of this um, korero as well as this um, uh, panel. Hi, my name's Ed Cox. Um, I'm from the um, 
an organization called the RSA. Uh, it's not the Return Services, it's, it's, it's the Royal Society for the Encouragement of Arts, Manufactures and Commerce, which is um, based in London in the UK. Um, we are, in effect, um, a membership-based organization, 29,000 fellows all around the world, including um, a handful in Auckland, and I'm meeting some of them today, alongside coming to this conference. Um, our organization is also a think tank. We do lots of policy research and thinking. Um, including into aspects of sustainability and climate change. Um, I think I've been invited here particularly because um, in a previous role, I helped to write um, an energy strategy for the north of England. Um, and the reason that's important in relation to just transitions is that, um, as some of you will be familiar, um, there are some very significant economic differences between the north and the south um, in um, England, in the UK. Uh, and so the policies that governments, whether they're local, national, regional, take about energy uh, have sig play out very significantly uh, differently in different parts of the country. So um, we've been working on what a northern energy strategy looks like and how we support businesses and workers in the north of England as government in London generally makes very poor policy uh, in relation to the north of England. I've um, been introduced for the second time. Uh, my name's Alana. I'm the Urban Transport Officer for the International Transport Workers Federation. So the inter um, ITF is a global union federation representing 20 million workers from um, over 147 countries from about 650 unions, including the main transport unions in um, New Zealand. We cover all the different transport sectors, maritime, aviation, um, road, rail, urban transport, um, as well as um, fisheries. Pena koutou katoa, he mihi tuatahi ki te mana whenu he nei rohe, ngā te whātua e mihi ana. Ki te kaunihira, te kaiwhakahaere nei, huri noa ki a tātou katoa, tēnā rā koutou. Kia ora everybody, I'm Maria Baj. Um, I've got a couple of hats, I guess, for, for being here. Why we're here is probably we could go on um, for some time uh, <laughs> on that one. I'm part of the independent advisory group um, with John and the team uh, on the action plan, um, but also have done um, some research on renewable energy. I'm very proud of my own hapu, which is based um, just out of Rotorua, um, uh, Te Arua Waka. Uh, we have our own micro hydro uh, and generate our own electricity um, at our marae uh, and always looking for ways of using that electricity on site. And I guess we heard um, a fair bit in the panel before about the vulnerability of Māori communities um, and the sectors that uh, Māori are involved with, you know, are particularly vulnerable to climate change um, and so on. But there are also really exciting things happening um, particularly in the areas of renewable energy generation. Uh, many Māori uh, land trusts and corporations um, heavily involved in that sector, geothermal and, and other things. Um, we have living buildings in um, Te Uruwera. So again, you know, some of the first in the, in the country, actually, um, that are living, properly living buildings. Um, and all sorts of other um, exciting um, things that are happening around the place. So. We do have some, some of the challenges and the vulnerabilities, but I think there are also some really exciting opportunities as part of a just transition. And um, Richard's probably about to ask this um, of us shortly, but um, for me, the, tra the just transition is focused on one that is tika, um, and according to tikanga Māori and a number of our values, and uh, which is cognizant of um, Treaty of Waitangi obligations that the Crown, central and local government um, have. Uh, so, looking forward to the discussion. Kia ora kato. Kia ora tēnā koutou katoa, ko Louise Takawingawa, uh, ko Akina Foundation to ko Mahi no Paniki Ahu. Um, I'm Louise Aiken, I'm the Chief Executive of the Akina Foundation. Um, Akina, uh, we were gifted our name by Ngāti Parau and it is um, to encourage bold action. We're taking it one tiny step further to actually do action. Uh, and it's really exciting to be here today, not only representing social enterprise, which are organisations that trade for a social and environmental purpose, uh, but also to really redefine what enterprise means. Um, we believe it must be inclusive, um, certainly 
as we all sit here today after Friday, um, that word means so much more now for all of us. Uh, but it must be sustainable, and we're really excited about what this means uh, into the future. So kia ora. Kia ora. Thank you, everyone. Um, we have about 25 minutes to have a bit of a discussion, but I might um, go back to Maria, actually, around um, what, what you see as, as a, just, a just transition and how we can find the right balance between, I think you were saying just before we came on stage, around an emergency and, and how we make sure we are transitioning for the people who are affected either way. Yeah, so, um, yeah, we were just talking about the possible challenges if there's an emergency kind of scenario when we know often political rights, other civil rights are dispensed with in, in some of those situations and that might not be ideal if we're thinking about how to unify communities um, and bring people together. Um, so for me, the just transition um, is a transition that's tika um, and that involves um, thinking about tikanga Māori and of course our definition of just transition has to be gra grounded in this place. We, we're here in Aotearoa, we are different from other places in the world, other places will be grounded in other kind of kaupapa from their indigenous peoples and their histories and, and cultures but here it has to begin with tikanga Māori um, with some of the values that are um, part of that for Ngatanga, which is about relationships, kaitiakitanga, our connections with the environment, uh, mana tapu utu, which is about the balance, and again, it's always helpful when uh, government, uh, whether it's local or central, has to consider which trade-offs um, to take. Um, and I would just note that tikanga Māori isn't just something that's a romanticised set of values that sit out in a rural area somewhere, um, but are very much... Um, able to be practised in urban in settings like this, um, wh whether it's with rooftop gardens or, or whatever it is, worm farms in, in the inner city and bees and so on. That's all part of kaitiakitanga and can um, be adapted. Um, but to be fully tika, um, again, I mentioned the Treaty of Waitangi obligations, and some of the central uh, elements there have got to be at the forefront of local government uh, and central government's mind as well. That's about partnership. I think a lot of the discussions we've seen around carbon zero, um, I've personally found um, rather frustrating because the idea of a treaty partnership hasn't been at the core of that. So we have an interim um, climate change commission that doesn't have any sense of treaty partnership. Um, we have some Māori involvement, but the terms of reference um, set out that they're not there as a representative of Māori. Um, but just for particular skills that they have. And um, really, we do have at a central government level um, some steps towards that by having uh, Māori electorates and, and Māori representatives, um, but we've still got a long way to go. I could go on at length, but I'll just pause there. I'm sure everyone else has got some, some <laughs> points to add. Um, thank you, Mireille. Um On to Louise, maybe just on, from your perspective, from a social enterprise a and where you're going and what the just transition could look like or is looking like. Yeah, it's pretty exciting at the moment. Um, we're, we haven't known the size of the social enterprise sector um, until very recently, um, partly because our legal structures don't reflect impact at all. You're either a charity, so one side of the coin, or you're a traditional business. You make money on one side and you give it away on the other side of the coin. And social enterprise kind of throws that coin away. Um, we know that there's about 3,711 social enterprises, um, importantly contributing about a billion dollars to the New Zealand economy, so it's not something small on the side, uh, and it's growing. Um, but really importantly, we want to recognise that social enterprises just are part of it. There is a big, big spectrum where impact um, can be delivered through business. And we're starting to see that change. Abby talked about it quite a lot this morning. Uh, businesses are waking up to three main things. Uh, one, their employees are no longer quiet. Uh, their future employees uh, no longer want to work for companies who are not doing something good for our environment or our society. Um, that has shifted every interview <laughs> with a young person over the last five years. Um, at universities now, you do not go and get new recruits unless you can talk about what you are doing in the environmental or social space. And that's extremely different from when I was at university many years ago. Um, we're also seeing it at a consumer level. Uh, consumers 
uh, voting with their pockets more so than anything. And that's really starting to hurt organisations who are hiding behind a nice flashy report or hoping that they can spend a bit of money in, in a, with a charity and think that it's okay then to make bad decisions. Uh, and so that's really interesting when we're starting to see uh, people deciding where to spend their money in a way that they haven't before. Um, but most importantly, and I know that a few people have spoken about it, um, investors are looking differently. Uh, if you are interested in a big number, um, a report was just released in January, and it was by the FAIR group, F-A-I-R-R. Um, they are a group representing $1.2 trillion of institutionalised capital. They went out to the six major fast food companies in the world and said, what are you doing in response to climate change? their answers will directly affect where that money will be invested. None of us could hope for something more important than that report. Frighteningly, there was 60 organisations named in that report who are not combating or not responding well to climate in their regard. Number four was Fonterra. I worked for Fonterra for 12 years and that is extremely frightening, not just because of the people that I care about who work there, but more importantly, our economy. If organisations like Fonterra and others are not attracting the capital that they need to transition to a new economy, we are the ones who suffer. Our poor people are the ones that suffer. Those young people who might not be able to be employed in the future are the ones who suffer. And that's where we really need to start thinking about the redefinition of what enterprise means. We need to think in line with frameworks such as the SDGs. Um, I'm surprised that we got to 10 past two and nobody's referred to the Living Standards Framework. It is the superpower for organisations like ours whereby the economy is no longer just the most important factor of what you are contributing to. So I think we need to really think about who we spend our money with, who we invest in. You know, we're all probably got Kiwi savers. Ask the question, where are, where's my money invested into? It's no longer good enough for it just to be negative stuff. We should be investing our money in positive social and environmental impact. And we should be asking much harder questions to the people who are selling us stuff. And so in my mind, the just transition is really redefining what enterprise should be. And that's a pretty exciting space to be in. Thank you. Um, now, Ed, you've probably got a um, bit of an example from an international perspective um, where you worked on an example of transitioning. Do you want, do you want to maybe let people know some of the struggles and maybe positive outcomes you were able to get through in the, in the UK? Yeah, thanks. Um, so for us, in, in uh, the context of the north of England, I think there were there are two particular challenges in relation to uh, just transition and, um, and then perhaps a couple of things that we can learn and, and, and ideas that I hope might be relevant in this context here. Um, the two uh, problems, if you like, are first of all, um, people living uh, in poverty, people who are less rich than uh, many others, and um, when we call for a just transition, very often that means energy prices rise, uh, and in the north of England we see many, many people living in what we call fuel poverty. Um, and so we have to think through what are the implications of um, uh, the way in which we tackle um, climate change and the implications that then has for energy, whether that's for transport costs or um, heating their homes and, and so on. And so um, what we've tried to do um, on that front is to ensure that municipal authorities um, have the powers and the funds uh, that they need in order to be able to, uh, if you like, uh, mitigate some of the challenges um, that poorer people have um, who perhaps are living in houses that need uh, greater levels of energy efficiency um, to improve their quality or indeed to support communities with their own micro generation. Um, there's a challenge around that which is that generally speaking the UK government um, 
has uh, very poor incentives um, and holds many of the powers to itself. So that doesn't allow for um, cities like Manchester or Leeds um, to be able to innovate and develop their uh, energy systems in the ways I've just been describing. Um, and so we've challenged that. We've, for example, suggested that the um, renewables funding that there is isn't held by the energy companies for whom they have absolutely no uh, desire or incentive to, uh, to be encouraging people to make energy efficiency savings, but instead be given to municipal authorities, local authorities, in order to be able to, to do that. So that's one aspect of the challenge that we have in relation to a just transition. The other is um, sort of more broadly across the region um, that as government has committed to reduce uh, coal-fired uh, uh, energy production, uh, by 2025, which we believe is a very good thing, um, it hasn't necessarily thought through what the implications are for a regional economy which has historically, uh, if you like, been the powerhouse for the nation in actual fact uh, due to its coal-fired power stations, nor the fact that it actually has a very high proportion of uh, related industries like the steel industry, for example, um, that uh, are heavily dependent or energy intensive uh, in that sense. So. Um, what we've tried to do here is to persuade the government, yes, that it's right to reduce uh, coal production, but it's got to think through the consequences much more effectively. Now, it just so happens that the north of England is also incredibly rich in renewable resources, and there's all kinds of plans that we've got for using tidal energy, uh, for using offshore wind. We've got some of the biggest offshore wind um, uh, uh, sites, if you like, all around um, the coast as well as um, onshore uh, opportunities as well. Um, and we've got some very, very interesting schemes uh, whereby we can use hydrogen much more effectively than we have done already with a view to places like cities like Leeds, for example, have got a plan to convert their entire gas system to hydrogen, uh, which would be really quite radical, uh, in fact, in a global context. But what we need is a government that actually uh, balances, if you like, the uh, challenges with those opportunities and once again frees up funding for innovation, for skills transition, for some of the workers that perhaps have worked in uh, energy intensive industries to be able to transition into what we think are probably 100,000 green jobs that we can create in the next 10 years um, in the north of England. Now we haven't got there yet, but we have um, set out a, a strategy which we are promoting within government and many of the municipal authorities and other players in the north of England have been coming behind that. So we hope to see uh, that implemented now over time. That's great. Thank you, Ed. Um, now, sorry to jump around a bit, but in, in the short time we have, I just might jump to Vicinia around um, future generations or current generations and maybe what the older generation should be doing or should have done. Um, but maybe a perspective, uh, you as one of our younger leaders in this city, around what we should be doing or what younger people are uh, talking about w when it's about climate change and how it affects work and, and transition. Sure. Um, so I was fortunate enough to actually go alongside uh, three of the leaders who um, actually were organizing the climate strike for schools. Um, and they, they actually went to go see the mayor. And so Jackie, who is um, going to be in the next um, panel, um, both myself and her went to go um, support um, their work and kind of provide any type of guidance or support in, in that area. And so um, a lot of the things that they, they, they said and addressed to the mayor himself is, is the idea that they just want to be recognized. As young people, we just want to be recognized and we're going to be allowed in these spaces. And I look around and we're talking about the future generations and we're talking about, you know, planning for the future. And I'm, I don't see many young people in this room. And um, they're a part of that process. They're, they're at the core of that process. And so uh, many of many of the conversations that they bring up is just wanting to be recognized, wanting to be allowed to be given the opportunity to, to, to be a part of that platform. And I think um, one thing that's very inspirational about young people nowadays is that we're the most, I, I like to think that the, we're, we're one of the most vocal generations when it comes to climate change. And so it's very interesting that we come into these spaces, well, I come into these spaces, and I, I, I don't see them. And so it's, it's this kind of idea that um, as decision makers, we need to be creating platforms that are inclusive. Yes, the discussion is kind of difficult to kind of um, ensure that it's, it kind of relates to every generation, but in essence, you're working together. And so um, a lot of the, I guess, the things that they wanted to just address is just the idea to be given um, 
just a chance to vocalize their opinions. And it's, it's, it's unfortunate that they have to do strikes in order for their voices to be heard. But just simple platforms such as this is, is, is just wanting to be heard. And so um, a lot of the things that they really wanted was to kind of reduce, um, ensure that we eliminate uh, the use of fossil fuels. Um, it was to kind of get to um, kind of get to a point of, I think, decreasing um, a level of carbon emissions. And so a lot of these things, um, they're, they're quite simple. And I think f for young people, it's, it's the idea that, I guess it's a s stigma that they don't care, but in essence, they're young, educated, and actions such as the climate change um, strike is, is, simple, is simple ways of kind of highlighting that they care as young people. I really think that's such an important part um, of this plan. I was a little bit disappointed when I heard this morning somebody saying that the young people Rangatahi's plan is going to go alongside the Auckland plan. It shouldn't be alongside, it should be within. And I think we've got past this structures decide and, and we've moved into a co-design phase and I think that's not even far enough. We need to get to a co-decision phase. Young people need to be part of the decision making, not part of the designing or having a voice. They need to be included in every conversation and making sure that they're signing off on the decision. Um, sadly, I went to um, Eco Novente, Novente Dois, which was the UN conference on climate back in 1992. Um, I was 17, so I'm telling you my age right there. Um, and I was part of the youth delegation. And over the weekend I went back and I looked at a document that I brought home with me, which was our plan that we wrote in 1992. I cannot find that plan anywhere online. I cannot find our voice anywhere not even within the accord that was signed the day after we wrote it. How disappointing if 27 years later, from today, the voice of youth is not part of a plan. Because at 44, I sit here and I'm disappointed that my voice wasn't loud enough back then. And I think the shame on all of us that whatever generation we are, if we don't ensure that the youth of today are actually the ones making the decision. Um, thanks. Uh, Alana, uh, you spoke about uh, the effect of change on workers, and I can think of our own examples um, with the public transport operating model that we that was set up under the last government that we've asked for a review on, is the, um, the effect on bus drivers when we are, you know, in one set, doing great work, increasing our public transport patronage, you know, very quickly, but suddenly, and I've seen it in my own community, the, the you know, big change and new networks and everything and the expectations on those drivers to know everything from day one and the customer and the, and the other workers on those buses, you know, putting huge pressure on, on drivers, you know, who are low paid and have to have, uh, you know, long hours. Mm -hmm. So what... What, how can we get workers and unions into into that um, into that system, and how can we use their knowledge and skills that they already have into this just transition? You know, even if we can't control maybe the speed at at all times. Yeah, so the first point I want to make that unions are already in the system, um, organising bus drivers on the basis of those kind of problems that you mentioned that they're experiencing um, every day. The one thing that I can conclusively say, trade unions support a massive expansion of public transport. We can see what the economic, environmental, social employment benefits are. But what's really surprising, and this is not just in New Zealand, but in many countries, when you look at sustainable transport policies, even though transport is a major employer globally, the role of the sector as a source of employment is given secondary importance. So there's a complete absence of any thinking about how you integrate sustainable employment practices into an overall strategy for sustainable um, transport. 
So what unions are saying is we want a massive expansion of public transport, but we don't want the same model that many unions are familiar with today, a model that has driven down terms and conditions of employment, where there's a race to the bottom, where there are problems for workers' safety, um, a whole range of different problems. So I think we have to see decent work and the creation of decent work as part of the social impact of investment in public transport. And we need to be honest with ourselves. An industry, any industry, cannot be sustainable if there aren't sustainable employment practices. And I think there are a whole range of very interesting initiatives on positive employment um, frameworks, labor impact assessments that need to be integrated into all the new industrial strategies that are being developed to avoid the kind of problems that you mentioned. Thank you. Does so anyone else want to comment on that work? I think just, just speaking to the UK context, and, and forgive me, Alana, we've not met, spoken, whatever, um, but I think it's worth, you know, for the sake of the debate and the discussion, um, and I don't know what it's like here, but in the UK context, I think there's a tension that we ought to be open about, which is that um, many uh, transport workers in unions are um, very resistant to the kind of changes that people would see to be progressive changes in relation to climate change. Um, in some of our rail systems, for example, um, there are newer, higher tech trains which don't need so many staff, just as I use that as an example. Um, and people would see these as cleaner and better trains, but the reason they can't be adopted on certain lines is because the unions are saying, no, no, they, they require fewer staff, therefore we're going to dig our heels in and say we're not going to have them. Similarly, with certain types of buses and bus routes and so on. And so I think we ought to acknowledge, certainly in the UK context, there are some tensions here, and it's how we go about transitioning um, and enabling things to happen. And the solution that I would offer, and, and this applies, I should say, for energy workers, not just for, not just for transport workers, um, is, is that there needs to be hand-holding, there needs to be training, support, lifelong learning programs so that people can actually find their way out of, let me call them dirty forms of transport or dirty industries, um, into cleaner jobs, greener jobs, but there needs to be proper skill support and provision to enable that to happen. To avoid the risk at the moment, I think we have, and certainly in the way it's perceived in the UK, is that actually unions appear opposed to moving into greener forms of transport and industry. Thank you, and I will, you know, say that too. I have seen, you know, we had a presentation at the Ports of Auckland last week around there, the way they're working with the Maritime Union and with staff on, you know, making automation a positive thing and how that they can transition people into, into use the current skills they have into the, the new cranes or the new um, being able to get behind um, the machine as opposed to maybe driving um, the machines or, or whatever it is. So I think there is a a big case for making sure that you can use automation and, and the change of, say, even just bus routes as a um, positive and help, but making sure we're not just turfing out people on the way through. Um, I guess maybe for Maria, and sorry to call you out on um, just Māori issues, but um, um, you know, you you might like to expand a bit more on, on your introduction around the Māori economy or the way we can use TL Māori examples or lessons through, uh, woven through the just transition um, process, that it's not, how do we make sure that it's not token and it's not just a stakeholder, it's actually true um, to the way you were speaking about earlier? Mm. Well, I guess it'll probably manifest in different ways. If you're thinking at a local government level, different mana whenua are going to have different views. I mean, one of the first um, slides we had up in the presentations earlier, Ngaitahu, had three for the sustainability uh, council. There were three lots of um, parts of Ngaitahu that are involved um, in um, kind of transitioning business, Ngaitahu business. Um, so mana whenua here are going to have quite different thoughts about it, um, given the kind of nature of the cities. Um, but I think when you think about some of the values, if you start with those, it helps um, construct some of the other bits and pieces. Um, particularly around balance and how you, which is utu, how you balance things out. Um, if something's taken away, something has to be given back. And so the environment, that's people to people relationships. Um, you have to uh, reconstruct a balance, um, but also with the environment. So if things are being taken away, 
um, you have to give something back. So that sounds a little bit abstract, but if you think of geothermal power production or something like that, you know, you can think in quite practical ways about how you would do that um, in terms of extracting stream and steam and generating electricity. And um, to Aropaki, a really good example, pretty well known example now, um, west of um, Lake Taupo, they have uh, two geoth geothermal power plants there. They have a temperature controlled glass houses for horticulture, a massive worm farm um, for those interested in the worms, um, where they put the green waste from those um, glass houses. And then they do also have a dairy operation. And so some of that produces the, um, the fertilizer for, for their dairy operation. But they're very much interested in a kind of not cradle to cradle so much as, but a certainly a circular view of um, limiting waste and, and thinking about where that all goes. And they want to be a beacon of hope for their people, um, but could probably be a beacon of hope for uh, uh, many of us um, as well. And that, so the business itself, generating an economic <coughs> effect, um, supporting the people on collectively owned land. And I guess that's another feature of many thousands of Māori um, trusts they're actually governed under the Māori Land Act, um, which makes things a little bit um, different from other businesses or, or enterprises. Um, so they've got um, those kind of added features which need to be uh, considered as well. Yeah, and th that brings up another good um, point around genuine consultation. And I don't know if you have any um, advice, I guess, for the leaders in the room, especially for Auckland. We have uh, a, a, high, a large number of uh, mana whenua to consult or work with, but also we have um, huge population of Mātāwaka that also have a voice. Um, how would you, do you have any adv advice on how we have genuine consultation that may, you know, just like any community, not everyone in māori has the same view on anything, just like every community. H how do we get through that kind of um, listening and consulting process? Mm, well, Ngāri Blair um, made some comments from his perspective this morning in, in terms of um, what um, a kind of mana whenua Ngāti Whātua view, but of course you've got the independent Māori statutory board um, and, as you say, Mā Tā Waka um, separate uh, from that. I think what the council's doing at the moment in terms of going to those different entities is, is the way to start um, and then for the process to be genuine. And, I mean, Ngāri Mu also mentioned being involved in at least two other processes <laughs> on climate change and there was a certain um, jadedness I think to, to his uh, response and I guess probably that could be a challenge to central government and to local government to actually demonstrate and maybe speak publicly about what's changed through the consultation process. I'd love to see that from a central government level from the carbon uh, zero bill proposals. Someone to James Shaw to publicly say what has changed from the beginning of the consultation to the final uh, outcome in response to, to Māori issues. But just um, thinking as well about the spaces in which we meet, um, maybe we should also have some of these meetings at schools and on marae, and that would certainly change the, the dynamic of how we begin the meeting, how we run the meeting, um, and all sorts of things. We could have the, the parakoria marae people, the waste-free marae um, folks, uh, helping um, <laughs> arrange that as well. So it's also about the physical spaces, I think, that we go to. Perfect. The, um, that brings me back to Vicinia. Um, around um, what Maria was talking about, around feedback and maybe consultation fatigue and the spaces you want to um, be sp spoken to or spoken with, um, what is, from your perspective, young what do young people want from people in this room and, and those maybe watching around how to consult, you know, how often and how do we, how do we follow up that it's not just post-its on a wall and you walk away and everyone feels nice about it, so. Um, I think for me, um, it's about providing information that people can understand, um, and particularly young people can articulate and contextualize, because sometimes I'm having to sit in these spaces and read you know, thousands of documents going through pages and pages and having to understand what the actual issue is, how this affects me as a young person, and what's going to get changed. And I think sometimes it's having to articulate through a bunch of pages just to get to the just to get to the point of it, and I think f when it comes to kind of um, the idea of how do we communicate these informations to young people, 
Um, it's about providing youth-friendly documents that can be easily articulated. But it's also about providing young people the opportunity to kind of take that information and then decide how they want to articulate it and kind of in a creative way and share amongst other people. And I think that's how you can get information from one person to another. And it's finding innovative, creative ways of how do we take an information that is hundreds of pages and kind of create this kind of platform where young people can kind of structure it and it can kind of make sense to other people, if that makes any sense whatsoever. That's fantastic. And it, um, yeah, I, I just want to pick up on that because um, I think you've articulated very well a problem that we have um, in relation to another kind of transition that I think we're going through at the moment that the RSA is very concerned about, and that's a democratic transition. And my sense is that we've moved from a situation where we try to handle these complex social environmental issues through representative democracy, through elected politicians. Uh, and we've recognized that there are some limitations to that, particularly the short-term political cycles that we uh, endure in those situations. And we've moved on to a more participative form of democratic decision-making. But we're stumbling with that as well because we're not knowing quite how to consult. When do you co-design? When do you co-decide? And, and, and who is involved? And how do you get them involved? And there's all kinds of issues around participative approaches as well. This is not to say that representative or participative pro approaches to democracy are wrong. It's just that they each have their own limitations. So I want to suggest that there's something more and better that you can do, which is around deliberative democracy. Deliberative democracy, um, there's a whole school of thinking around it, um, but it very, very carefully um, chooses by random selection a group of people who are much more representative than either participative or representative forms of democracy can ensure. So you could ensure that the right proportions of young people are involved in a citizens' assembly on climate change for Auckland. Or you could ensure that the right proportions of people in relation to Maori people are involved in that kind of deliberative process. And then you don't need the papers in quite the same way. You would have a series of weekends where experts from different sides of the argument can come and present. And crucially, you need commitment from, um, in this case, the Auckland Council, or it could be you know, from the decision makers to listen to what the assembly has got to say. And you also need a key question to actually drive the whole thing. Simply asking for them to come up with a plan is not enough, but if there are some critical issues, you could do that. So I offer you the idea of exploring um, the idea of some kind of citizens' assembly or citizens' jury on climate change for Auckland as a, a perhaps a, a, a different way of approaching how you might set about creating uh, decisions on, on climate change in a, in a city like this. Thank you very much, Ed. We have about one minute left, so maybe Louise or Alana, if you've got any final thoughts or yeah um, <laughs> just one Anything? thing because I'm going to do a plug for for something that we're about to launch um one of the big things that uh, is really missing to get to where we need to go to a to you know a, a low carbon or a zero carbon future is innovation and that support around building capability this is an agree in organizations whether they're startups whether they're community groups whether they're um, big business who are trying to think about doing things differently um New Zealand is pretty good at saying, oh, look, things can be done in the back of a shed and a number eight wire and all of that. Well, that's not good enough anymore. Uh, what we need is a really supportive uh, capability process when it comes to environmental innovation. Um, and in a couple of months, we're going to launch, along with WWF, um, with the support of Auckland Council uh, and others, a environmental innovation program. And that's a 12-month uh, support for taking ideas to impact um, and having investment funds, uh, having supply chains, uh, having consumers, um, and having governments, whether they be local or central government, at the end of that. Um, because it's not, no longer good enough that we just hope that government or philanthropic is going to sort this stuff out. Um, business needs to be part of it, um, particularly supply chains. Um, New Zealand businesses spent $561 billion on expenditure last year. So corporate social responsibility is not that number. Supply chains are. So think about where you're spending your money if you're a business because there is environmental and social benefit that you can get from the stuff you're buying anyway. So this is really what we need to focus on is actually upending 
the way we think about the economy and the way that we think about where environmental innovation can come from. So keep your eye out for something that will be hitting in around about May. And just very quickly from, from me, I'm just really pleased that we've had the opportunity to look at the role of um, trade unions and the involvement of workers in just transition process. And I think what I really want to emphasize about that, as you saw from the 10-point plan that I put on my slide, that we need to view that sort of comprehensively and holistically. It's not just about jobs in the short term, it's about worker participation in economic planning, industrial policy, as well as industrial transformation. Workers have those ideas, they have that knowledge, and you know, it's really important that they are able to participate in both the planning and decision making. Just one last point, I think probably what has been neglected in our discussions, both this morning and this afternoon, is the whole issue of gender. And I think it's really important that we recognize um, at both the workforce level as well as users of various public services like public transport, that there are very significant gender differences and that climate policies and new industrial policies really need to address that. Otherwise, we are not gonna be doing anything towards overcoming discrimination against women or contributing towards gender equality. So I think that needs to be much more directly and um, strongly integrated um, into our system. Thank you very much. And uh, last word from politician, as usual. <laughs> but um, <laughs> before, before I th uh, we thank the, the panel, just want to once again thank you all for being here and all the work you're doing in, your, um, in our community, um, no matter what that community is. But also, as a, from a politician, this year is an election year, I think. <laughs> It is very important for you all to encourage people to stand. Um, people, um, you know, when we're talking about gender diversity, people from different communities, um, anyone can stand. Um, encouraging people to vote and keeping all the candidates um, honest. You know, ask questions. People, unfortunately, aren't that interested in local government. It's, um, but I think it's extremely important, and I feel local government often has the most easily connected um, voice to community back and forth and it can be really really um, positive you know movement for fo uh, force for movement so just please encourage people to vote stand and um, get three or four young people you know enrolled because um, often it's not the easiest um, process still so um, thank you all for being here could everyone give um, our panel a fantastic big hand Um, right, now we're just about to um, launch into another panel session, but first there's going to be a, um, a video um, contribution first. Um, this is on the very important um, subject of blue and green networks, i.e. water and land um, and the, the natural systems in there. Uh, this is given by uh, Todd Gartner, who's the director of the Natural Infrastructure Initiative at the World Resources Institute. Well, WRI is, of course, one of the great um, granddaddies of the um, US environmental um, movement going back to the um, early 70s. And um, I want to make a slight apology for this um, presentation. You can hear it, um, but it looks as though Todd just kind of plonked himself down in front of his laptop late at night at the end of a long day. Uh, and he's kind of just talking at the laptop. I, I think we can all relate to this. So I don't think this is going to get in the way of the message. I was just Googling where he's based. Uh, I'm not sure whether this is where he did this. He could have been done, doing it anywhere in the world. But he's based in Baltimore. And that had real resonance for me because Baltimore um, is an old and decaying city um, in an old and decaying industrial heartland. Um, but there is uh, signs of terrific regeneration going on in Baltimore. Um, so to have a, a message about blue and green networks um, from somebody based in Baltimore um, seems very appropriate. So uh, please give us Todd late at night. Thanks very much. Kia ora. I'm Todd Gartner, Director of Cities for Forests and the Natural Infrastructure Initiative at the World Resources Institute. 
For those of you unfamiliar with WRI, we are a global environmental organization focused at the nexus of environment, economic opportunity, and human well-being. We have over 700 staff working across 60 countries. We don't have an Auckland office as of yet, but I put in for my transfer and hope to join all of you for a great walk along the Tungariro Crossing or Rope Burn Track, really reliving my glorious adventure days backpacking in 2002 across your amazing country. Many thanks to the Chief Sustainability Office at Auckland Council for the opportunity to share this video address at your climate symposium. And apologies that I could not join you in person. I am, however, recording this address from my home in Portland, Oregon, which many folks consider the New Zealand of the US for whatever that's worth. First, I want to congratulate all of you for the incredible ambition of the Auckland Climate Action Plan. It follows in New Zealand's tradition of bold climate commitments, and it is exactly the determination we need more of, especially from places like my own home country of the US. But meeting ambitious goals isn't easy. And in order to do it, I predict that you would need to look at all sectors of your economy and even beyond the four walls of the city of Auckland itself. It's not just about the infrastructure you can build on your city streets. It's about the web of infrastructure that brings food, water, and fuel into your city from miles away. It's not just about the number of trees you can plant in your parks. It's about the impact that Auckland's consumption has on the forests far away in Indonesia, Brazil, and even Central Africa. How can we get our heads around this idea, this idea of natural infrastructure? At WRI, we are convening a group of 50 plus major cities from Jakarta to Johannesburg and Oslo to Mexico City, and Auckland is included in that group. All to tackle the question of how cities can meet their ambitious sustainability goals, in particular through conserving, managing, and restoring trees, forests, and other forms of natural or green infrastructure alongside the built environment. The group of cities is called Cities for Forests, and we are breaking down this incredible challenge into three digestible scales, inner, nearby, and far away forests. Let me start with some ideas related to the inner forests and green infrastructure. Green infrastructure inside the city, like street trees, parks, green spaces, and bioswales, even rooftop gardens, have immense potential to help Auckland and other cities meet climate goals while improving the lives of its residents. Stormwater management is particularly an important service to think about in terms of inner forests and green infrastructure. The city of Portland, Oregon, where I live, has reduced urban flooding by 80% in target areas since implementing an urban green infrastructure agenda starting in 2011. This has yielded over $220 million of cost savings related to water infrastructure alone. Urban forests, for example, also help cleanse the air of pollutants, reducing the incidence of respiratory disease, and their presence makes you feel better. One recent study in Toronto, Canada, found that an additional 10 trees on a city block improve people's perceptions of their health by an amount comparable to a $10,000 increase in income, or to feeling seven years younger. I'm 96 years old, and I spend a ton of time in the forest, so it must be true. But I know what you're thinking. How do we pay for it? How do we think about funding our green infrastructure? No one city agency can afford it by themselves. But if we get creative, there is a ton of promise. In California, we're piloting an innovative financing tool called a Joint Benefits Authority to bring green up infrastructure to scale in the city of San Francisco. The innovation behind the Joint Benefits Authority is that it unites multiple city agencies behind one project, 
where each agency co-invests in the same hectares of green infrastructure, but only pays a portion of the total costs, commensurate with the benefits their agency is recognizing in relation to its mandate. So for example, the water utility would be paying for the stormwater benefits it's recognizing. The Department of Transportation is paying for the protection of the road and bridge infrastructure. The Office of Sustainability is paying for climate benefits, and the Health Department is covering the multitude of benefits that they care most about. No one agency could afford the entire project, nor could they justify the expense. But in aggregate, the agencies bring enough money to the table to finance the entire project. The Joint Benefits Authority tool has the potential to move San Francisco agencies away from simply coordinating on joint projects and towards a joint funding model to deliver multiple integrated public benefits on climate and other critical service to the public and their residents. And their residents. We often hear cities struggle with the conflict between providing affordable housing and ensuring land is available to be used for these green infrastructure ideas. We are working with San Francisco to ensure the initial pilot project that I just described will be integrated into their plans to address the rapid urbanization that they're seeing, while also looking to site the project in a disadvantaged community where the benefits can go the furthest to improving people's lives while improving their resilience to climate change and storing carbon. But as we are discovering, your climate innovations can't just stop at the border of your city. You have to look at the surrounding areas, the forested watersheds that provide your drinking water, the natural ecosystems that support local farms, the timber baskets and recreational areas that your city depends upon. For example, we are working with Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, which is struggling with increasing water quality problems. One challenge is that the forest loss and landscape degradation upstream of the city is causing immense soil erosion, which generates more pollution and fills reservoir with sediment instead of with water. This causes costly water treatment and dredging needs. WRI, in partnership with local organization and the city itself, applied our economic green-gray assessment, a tool that helps water utilities, water-dependent companies, and investors examine the costs and benefits of utilizing green infrastructure in combination with traditional built infrastructure. We found that restoring 3,000 hectares of native forests in targeted priority locations around Rio's watershed would help avoid costs of nearly $80 million over 30 years, or over $2.5 million of cost savings per year. Investing in forests would also spare the use of an estimated 4 million tons of chemical products and 260 megawatt hours of energy in water treatment over the next 30 years. A huge win for forests, water, the climate, and the city of Rio de Janeiro. We've seen similar stories play out time and again. In the eastern U.S. where I grew up, natural wetlands moderated damages from Hurricane Sandy in 2012 by an estimated 625 million dollars. In the early 2000s, Vietnam implemented a widespread mangrove restoration project integrated with dike systems to reduce coastal flooding. The combination of green and gray infrastructure ultimately saved $215 million of flooding impacts plus countless carbon-related savings. Perhaps the biggest untapped opportunity around climate and sustainability for cities, including Auckland, is the role of faraway forests and natural infrastructure. Forests and land-based strategies are now estimated to constitute up to one-third of the cost-effective actions to prevent catastrophic climate change, including reducing emissions from deforestation and enhancing carbon storage through reforestation and restoration. A few things the city of Auckland can do. 
One, you can think about enacting forest-friendly procurement policies. These would include avoiding the sourcing of products associated with deforestation like soy, beef, palm oil, unless those products are independently certified as legally and sustainably produced. Providing markets for legally harvested and sustainable timber can provide rural communities with incentives for keeping forests as forests rather than converting them to other uses. Huge carbon and climate benefits. Second, we can think about providing a market for forest ecosystem services, especially carbon. Many of the world's leading cities, including Auckland, have made commitments to achieve carbon neutrality by mid-century or even before. While most emissions reductions can and should be achieved through reducing the burning of fossil fuels, the purchase of forest carbon offsets from tropical forest jurisdiction could be the icing on the cake. But those initiatives are not enough. We need to raise awareness across all agencies and across all of our city residents. Most urban dwellers are unaware of how much their well-being depends on goods and services generated by forests. Environmental education can help citizens make more forest-friendly choices with their spending and voting power. We can also raise awareness by further incorporating sustainably sourced timber from faraway forests into urban building. A renaissance in the use of wood in urban architecture is underway. Combining its inherent aesthetic and structural properties with new technologies to erect efficient and low carbon building is the wave of the future and cities can galvanize a new direction of thinking about this approach. In conclusion, Auckland has the opportunity to really seize the mantle of leadership on these issues of green infrastructure and climate change, all while making the city an even better place to live for residents. I would love to talk to any of you more about these ideas or what we are doing with Auckland through Cities for Forests. I invite you to reach out to me with any questions or better yet, invite me back to Auckland so I can get a less faded t-shirt than the one I have to support the All Blacks. I wish you a productive conference and look forward to continued engagement. Best of luck and thank you so much. Heck, how many times has that t-shirt been through the washer to, to you know, the all grays? Uh, well, a masterful presentation by Todd on um, the importance of green infrastructure and, of course, a fabulous opportunity for us in Auckland, uh, um, in nearby and far away, to really engage on that. And not a word of Baltimore. This is a really ca textbook case of where how dangerous single source stories are. I had extrapolated one phone number into a whole narrative about Baltimore. And so his phone number's on the East Coast, but his home is on the West Coast. So. Anyway, there we are. Uh, so uh, I'd now like to welcome up our panel, please. And once they're all, this is for a land transport discussion. And once they're all here, I'll introduce them. So whilst they're coming up, give yourself a bit of a stretch, because we've got about another 45 minutes to go before afternoon tea. Um, so my panelists, please. So uh, it's, um, it's, uh, there's three mics going on each side. So it's just like that. Right. Right. Uh, right, we're ready to go. Um,
and uh, I'm trying a slightly perilous thing with this microphone. <laughs> um, it's uh, my uh, great pleasure to interview, uh, 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 introduce you to um, our panelists. Um, moving from my immediate um, right on down the line, the first person is Shane Ellison, who's CEO of Auckland Transport. Um, Shane, uh, born and raised in the South Island, uh, Whakapapa linking back to Naitahu and to Atiawa, um, but then 20 years overseas um, on major transport um, projects. So um, back in New Zealand and at Auckland Transport since December uh, 2017. And um, next to Shane is Rachel. Uh, Rachel Lees Green is um, with the um, environment consultancy um, MR Cagney, uh, and her speciality is. Um, sustainability of transports. Very interestingly, uh, Rachel has a PhD in biomedical engineering and decided to use those analytical skills to apply them to these sorts of issues. Um, next to uh, Rachel is uh, Jacqueline Paul, uh, Napui, uh, Nati Fa, uh, Tufarotoa, uh, and uh, uh, um, Nati Kaunugu, uh, Hadotonga, and uh, as landscape architect, researcher for the National Science Challenges on building better towns and homes, and so works both at AUT, uh, where she's in, um, and then she's also a lecturer in the School of Architecture at Unitech, and um, is co-founder um, of um, Innovative Limited and a member of the Auckland Youth Advisory Panel for um, Auckland Council. Um, next to Jacqueline is um, Councillor uh, Chris Darby, and um, Chris, um, is, has been deeply engaged on these issues of deep sustainability um, of Auckland um, before he came into council and then very effectively in council. And on my far right is Professor um, Ian White, who's head of environmental planning at the University of Waikato. And um, uh, Ian also has a role as a visiting professor at the University of Manchester in the UK, so um, is deeply involved in these sorts of issues um, in, um, in Europe too. Uh, so first of all, um, could you give um, all our panelists a, a very warm welcome, please? Thank you very much indeed. Um, because this is a panel um, where um, people have not had a chance to speak first, um, we thought we would just offer them um, a very um, particular um, framing question um, and, and to speak very briefly to. Um, as to what does a, a zero emissions climate ready transport system like look like to you? Um, what, what are the key attributes that you identify? So I'm gonna go down the line um, starting from um, Shane who um, obviously lives and breathes this stuff in his work. Um, so Shane, um, uh, the, the key attributes for you of a, a, a zero emissions transport network. Kia ora koutou. Um, Kia um, ora Thanks for the opportunity to be here. Um, I can imagine that it's, uh, some of you have, uh, are finding the last few days quite challenging, but uh, anyway, oh, it's, it, is, uh, it is good be, to be here. Um, as you know, I'm uh, Chief Executive of Auckland Transport. Um, up front, I'd just like to say that we are committed to uh, addressing the challenges that are coming uh, with emissions and, and climate. Um, you might be surprised to know that it's our second most important priority, um, and it's our second most important priority behind safety and road safety. Um, just uh, the nature of the challenges we have at the moment, uh, that, uh, that, that consumes a lot of our focus and attention. Nevertheless, in terms of climate and emissions, uh, and zero emissions uh, in terms of the transport system, we've already made a good start. Some of you will be surprised to know that in terms of our public transport system, um, over 20% of our trips are made on zero emissions vehicles. Uh, that's on our rail network, obviously. Uh, by 2025, um, we will only be purchasing zero emissions buses, and by 2040, we will have an entire fleet that is intended to be zero emissions. Obviously, land use and transport planning is a key driver 
of uh, minimising the number of kilometres that need to be travelled in uh, fossil fuel vehicles. And um, thanks to the support of people like Councillor Darby here in central government, uh, we're inv investing $13 billion over the next 10 years in public transport and walking and cycling. The more modal shift we can achieve getting people out of vehicles, single occupant vehicles and vehicles to public transport and walking and cycling, the better we'll be off. Um, and uh, I guess the other, I guess, elephant in the room is transitioning from uh, fossil fuel cars to electric vehicles. Um, it creates about 85 to 90 percent of the emissions uh, from the transport network in Auckland, and it's a huge challenge. Um, and we'll talk. So I guess we'll talk some more about that. But from us. Um, the other consideration that we have in mind is, some of you may know, we're the guardian of about $19 billion worth of assets in Auckland. Um, clearly, in terms of resilience, um, we're doing some quite a bit of analysis at the moment around the risk to the transport network and what steps we have to take going forward. Um, thank you very much indeed. Um, a, a big hand for uh, Shane. Thank you very much. Um, Rachel, a, a zero emissions network, how, how does it look to you? What are the key characteristics? So I guess Shane's already talked about a lot of the things that I think we all would agree are important. Um, I think fundamentally transport is about access. It's access to other people, to education and jobs, to opportunities to have fun, to opportunities to access the outdoors. And so the more that we can do to make sure people can access all of those things without having to rely on fossil fuels, the better off we're going to be. And so obviously public transport is going to be a big part of that. Shifting to electric vehicles for private vehicle use is a big part of it. Um, but creating cities where people can walk and cycle to a lot more opportunities and also creating opportunities for um, not where people can access what they need in their local communities, so we're minimising the amount of transport that people need to do, I think is a really critical part of the solution. Fine, thank you very much, Neve. Uh, uh, so a warm hand, please, for um, Rachel. Um, next up, Jacqueline, thanks. Uh, yeah, I guess I just want to talk for what's already been said about, I guess, the aspirations of moving from, you know, from what we were like, you know, being car dependent into modal shift and all these great aspirations. Like, the idea is great, but actually the economic reality of these things for some of our families, you know, we can't afford to buy a flash electric car. So always kind of reminding ourselves that transition period, actually how are we thinking about these communities that are going to be impacted. So just trying to ground these great aspirations in terms of, you know, our communities who are really going to struggle. Again, around um, walking and cycling, um, and making that accessible, I totally, totally call that. Um, ensuring that there's the, I guess, infrastructure to support that, it's another one, in terms of yeah, electricity, um, the idea is great, but do we actually have the capacity and capability to support that infrastructure at the moment? So trying not to be too ambitious, but really grounding in terms of the realities around that um, is important to highlight, yeah. Fine, thank you very much indeed, um, Jacqueline. Chris, the, the great holy grail of a zero emissions transport network. Yeah, well, look, um, um, Shane's touched on, uh, you know, the transport uh, aspects there, and, and, and others are echoing that too. But, like, my jurisdiction as planning committee chair is over the physical infrastructure of Auckland. So my job is actually to not just look at transport, to actually, but to look at uh, land use patterns. And so what we've inherited is... A, totally unbalanced and uh, uncoordinated pattern of development in Auckland. Uh, that's what we are living with now. And we are now car dependent, we're mortgaged to our motor vehicles uh, because of land use patterns which have been totally out of whack. Unbalanced, uncoordinated, not connected. And then we've also, with that, inherited uh, a transport network, well, in, in some ways, it wasn't a network. It, it, too, was disconnected and unbalanced. So you've actually got the fury of, of both problems staring at you. And that, for me, is 
the, the nub of the problem in terms of reducing emissions. One is we can't do one in isolation of the other. Um, and so while we charge Auckland Transport to deliver a, the network approach to resolving uh, the transport challenges, uh, they are not doing that in isolation of the planning of the, the development patterns. So we have landed that through unitary plan two years ago. We've further landing it and looking out through the Auckland plan. Uh, and then we're tying in ATAP, the Auckland Transport Alignment Project, into that. And so we're, we're getting there, but it's still very, very early days. Looking ahead to get to, the, to, to answer that question, we are now going to have to really amp it up. And we're going to have to be quite radical in the interventions that we make. And I think we're going to almost going to have to go back and review of a few things that are, are very recent decisions in ATAP and recent decisions in the unitary plan to make those substantial changes. Because even the, where we are right now is n not going to get us within Kiwi of meeting those challenges. Not within Kiwi. That is the bull, bull, you know, uh, honest fact of the matter. Um, Ian, I'm very keen on your views, uh, whether they are a, a judgment on how we're doing in Auckland or taking a bigger view, whichever you prefer to do. And we can come back to the other in due course. I'd like to take a bigger view, if I may. Um, just as an aside, I, I think a lot of this is settled. Uh, we know the link between land use and transport, we know walkability, we know mixed use, we know public transport, we know what we should do. I've never seen so many nods in a room <laughs> in my life, and, and there's no real dissenting voices. So the question for me isn't what we should do, it's why is it so hard? And, and that then brings us towards some of the questions we've had before around governance, around politics, around power, around structures, around decision making. This is something, I think Auckland, it, it feels a little bit like, yeah, an A student who's being told off on not, not being A star, but the reality is, as Chris said, you started off 50 metres behind the start line, and the fact you've been given a real difficult um, situation to try and, if you want to, let's do a little thought experiment. If you wanted to design a city that was incredibly reliant on fossil fuels, Auckland would be a bad start, to, you know, place to start. You know, we, we, about 10 years ago, maybe, that would be fair, but now, we're actually making some good ground, but that's the kind of reality. And, and urban forms don't change very much. We did some research around 10 years ago to try and get a, a percentage about how much, how dynamic a city is, how much do they change? And it was around one to 3%, depending on your development patterns. So 97% of our urban form is already there. And, and that's, that's the scale of challenges. How much does our decision-making affect property rights? Um, lobbyists around what the character of neighborhoods are, what we should change. So I think the other thing I wanted to make is um, there's a lot of really interesting words been said today around ambition, crisis, emergency, radical change, a speed of change which we've never seen before. To what extent is this possible within our systems? You know, why is this a different challenge than say sustainability 20 years ago? You know, how, how can we make sure that these words, which are actually quite risky, if these were private sector words, and you were working in an organization, the CEO said, we need to innovate, we need to change, this is radical. This would be massively risky. To what extent do we have the appetite for that risk, and how much are we being incremental? So those are the, the questions that I'd like us to reflect on before I pass back to Rod. Fine, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> um, could I start by um, asking uh, the panel, and please feel free to, re however many you want to respond. Um, Auckland um, is, uh, has been growing fast, will continue to grow fast, um, so we need to build a lot of new stuff, but at the same time we're rebuilding a lot of old stuff. Uh, and therefore my question is, doesn't that in itself present an opportunity to quite significantly reshape the city, or, or are you saying um, d d to us, um, um, Ian, that um, actually that th the ability to change that um, built environment is actually quite limited? 
Well, I think the mechanisms we have, uh, um, actually, they're focused on new development. It's just the nature of the beast is that we have a lot of tools and mechanisms to focus on things that haven't happened yet. What's already there, there's less ability to change it. And that's, um, if you think about the government toolbox, we've got taxation, we've got incentives, we've got law, we've got regulation, we've got directions. How, how creative are we are about using all of those to change the things we've got? And uh, I think there's a lot, of, there's probably too much onus on local government to lead the way here. I think this is about central government too. Why don't we have a train between Auckland and Wellington? It, it's just crazy as someone coming five years ago moving here. Why isn't, and we've got a really low national debt why don't we spend some of that money and actually transition? Because transitioning costs money, and it takes leadership, and that's what I think we're lacking, particularly the relationship between central government, local government, and the market. Thanks. Um, uh, Chris, the Auckland plan, the unitary plan, ATAP, um, gets us part of the way there, but you, would you like to expand on how much more might need to happen to, to get a big shift in um, our built environment? Yeah, but I would like to reflect on the last question yeah, yeah. as well, because uh, I don't think this is necessarily... We, we think about a problem, we think we have to build something to solve the problem. So we've got a roading network in Auckland, which uh, in the urban area is about 30% of, of the footprint of, of the landscape. And uh, it, it's there now, we're just not using it properly. And it's utilisation of what you've got. You know, if you've got a growing family, maybe many of you have been in the situation, uh, you have another child, you don't say, oh, we've got to go and buy a bigger house straight away. You think about, well, we might knock that wall down and put in bunks or, you know, you make better use of what you've got mm. before you go and say, let's go and raise a mortgage, another half a million dollars and buy a new home somewhere. I, I think the first thing is we've got to start reallocating the road space of Auckland. At the moment... It is given over to 1.1 occupancy vehicles in the AM and PM peak. That's what, what it's given over to. Totally inefficient use of the road space. Uh, if we're going to re reduce emissions, we need to reallocate that road space pretty damn quick smart. That would be m my... That, that's where we need to home in in the first instance. Because there's, a, there's actually a lot of room on the road. It's just not being used n remotely efficiently. So just going back to the question, and I, and I probably um, gave you the opportunity to ask that earlier. I think um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of good things that have landed in the unitary plan. Uh, we are compacting the city and we're provide, providing for node developments. You know, your, your Woolworths and your, uh, and your other satellites like Pukekohe, Woolworths a little bit difficult because it is car dependent for a, a while. And so you entrench that further car dependency. Going south, there's a lot of possibility connecting through the rapid transit rail network, the busway system. We're seeing the market respond now as well. We're seeing a tremendous number of dwelling consents that are uh, being uh, landed within 1.5 kilometres of rapid transit. So the market is waking up. People are waking up that they actually want to be living in proximity to earning and learning. They don't want a mortgage, a motoring mortgage, which is an hour travelling by private motor vehicle from the outer regions of Auckland. So I think we've done some good things in the unitary plan, but um, a task that I've asked my sta our staff to look at is what did we lose through the IHP process, that's the independent hearings panel process, what did we lose, what did we get knocked back on that we didn't have time to, to put back on track that is important to us now. Two years on, since the unitary plan's been operative, what do we need to go back and address? And so that's a body of work that the council's doing at the moment. ATAP is, is, is pretty fresh, but I think even now, what we now n know today, compared with a year ago, even just one year ago, Rod, on ATAP, is vastly different. If we were doing ATAP today, we'd be doing it even with more transit focus and more PT focus, more active focus. Who would have thought that 2019 was going to be the, the year of um, personal electric mobility? And I'm not just thinking of Lime and Wave and Bird. There's a whole wave of new personal mobility solutions aiming at us, if not here, uh, and coming. So just thinking about how swiftly these, th these things can change and they are going to change very, very fast. 
I think we need to be more dynamic with our planning documents. They can't be stay documents that stay one way for six years until the six year review time comes. Thanks. Um, Jacqueline or uh, Rachel, any response to this question of um, uh, whether we can achieve um, a, a big shift in urban form uh, or whether by nature we're kind of locked into what we've got and we just have to use it better? I guess it's such, you know, it's such a massive picture. Sometimes it's like, where do we start? Because if we think about uh, a lot of the urban regeneration projects that are going on right now, uh, let's use Glen Innes for an example, which was initially not done well. And so a lot of our low socioeconomic, specifically Māori and Pacifica communities, are going to be pushed out and have been pushed out. Um, and so now we're going to have Transform Manukau, another, you know, and Mangere, all these massive urban regeneration projects, and we're going to keep getting pushed out. And it's harder for us in terms of accessing, you know, we're going to be building greenfield developments in places where there isn't current infrastructure, which is costing us a lot more money, and it's difficult for us to move around. And so we're so dependent on cars because it's hard for us to get around places. And this is the reality now. So. In terms of urban form, at a dwelling scale, we have all this green star stuff, um, you know, emissions, at a dwelling scale in buildings. But we don't have, I guess, which I know council are working on in terms of a green infrastructure plan, in terms of actually how are we, you know, building communities, not housing development. How do we change our mind shift around we sit, you know, we're working with communities, humanising these places and stop creating this political and community divide and focus on the well-being of people because I t it tends to get lost in all of this political corridor. Um, so how do we really actually shift so we're, it's meaningful? We're focusing on you know, spaces that are measured by your well-being indicators you know, as opposed to this is how many people take trips. Well, actually, let's understand the experience that these people tra you know, transition from one place to another. So how do we change even the processes and the methodologies that we're working with now to work towards you know, these larger goals? Fine, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, that's a really, really good point to make, that it, it's not just about what we're building, but how we're going about doing it. And I'd also like to add, sort of uh, taking it a step further, it's not just about building things at all. We also need to see social shifts to encourage change. And I'd like to bring up an example. Um, there's a lot of evidence that women walk and use public transport more than men do, and men are more likely to drive in Auckland and across New Zealand. And yet, for a lot of women, safety is a big concern when using public transport, especially in the evening um, or later at night. Twice as many women as men don't use public transport at night because they're scared. And that's, like, we can build all the buses and trains that we want, but if people aren't feeling safe, they're not going to use it. And there was a really awful news story that came out on the weekend about two young Muslim women who were horribly harassed while waiting at a train station. And if, if we allow things like that to keep happening, then we're not going to see the changes that we need to see, and we're not mm. going to see equitable change in the way that people are getting around. And thank you. Um, I'm going to ask a question of Shane and then come to you all with uh, your questions. So if you start flagging down the people with the microphones, please do, so we can come fast to you. Um, Shane, you seem to have, you and your colleagues have an impossible task of um, an, an enormous um, body of assets um, and uh, you've got plans to develop them. But as Chris is just saying, well, actually, if we did ATAP a, a year later, there would have been a much bigger shift in emphasis on public transport and the like. Are there any um, ideas out there in, in, in your domain, internationally and locally, as to how it's possible to um, uh, plan and build um, uh, in, in far more flexible ways what are incredibly long-term and uh, and permanent pieces of infrastructure? Um, I think the challenge that is in front of us is actually twofold. One is um, that we're expecting enormous population growth between now and 2050. What's happened the last, the city, the region's been changing for the last 
10 years, at least significantly the last 10 years, and that won't slow down, that'll, that'll continue. So that's a huge challenge for us uh, in Auckland. I think the second thing uh, really which a, a number of the panel members has touched on is, um, is the car dependency thing. And it's, a, it's easy to say car dependency, but when you're trying to transform a city where people have grown up and have known nothing different than the convenience of a private motor vehicle, to ask them to give up their car parking spaces on the sides of roads and giving up lanes for, uh, for buses and walking and cycling is an enormous challenge. Um, it's not to say it can't be overcome and it's not to say it's something we won't be taking on. Um, but, but that's a, you know, you know, we're coming from a long way back, as has been said. So it's a big challenge in front of us. Um, clearly, we are supportive of intensification. Um, it means you can get better use of what you do have in terms of your transport networks. And without it, better optimisation, as, as Chris has talked about, um, I'm not actually sure we can afford it. Thank you. Um, um, Ian? I just said like, growth is a challenge, but it's also an opportunity because partly around public transport is the density of people who live nearby around networks. And we can now direct where those people should live or maybe where we can plan for them better. So we've historically had this sprawl model you know, at the edges and low density, and it just means public transport isn't really that viable. And if you've got a city which is growing steadily and you've got the numbers on that growth, then the opportunity is to get that in your plan and make sure your land use plan links with your transport plan within an integrated way. And have a, there's something, um, there's a story around six weeks ago, which was the, there was something around the climate change and the local government leaders not signing this voluntary declaration on climate change. And I thought it, and the story became, all these people not believing in climate science. And that wasn't the story. The, the story was, why is this voluntary? Now, this is perhaps the biggest challenge our species face and we've got a number of levers and mechanisms and we're relying on a voluntary mechanism and it's it's, such, it's also a cry for help is that this wasn't about the science this was about helping our economies transition to a different future and I think this is where central government needs to step up this is partly around direction and providing a vision of the kind of future for New Zealand and then you can align all these decisions all these myriad of decisions that happen every day you can provide them with a direction of this is the kind of decision we would prefer you to wait more than others. And that was part of the challenge. And thank you. Um, questions from, from you all? Any takers? Uh, got, um, oh, yes, Graham, thank you. Hi. Um, I just uh, have a question for Chris Darby. One of the scandals, in my view, of the independent hearings panel, of the unitary plan, was that they gutted uh, rules that were written into the draft plan that was widely consulted on and had a good deal of support requiring new developments to be built to a Green Star standard, arguing that this was covered by the Building Act, which is 72 years old and, and just simply doesn't really get it and that was no answer at all. So um, how, how quickly can we move on either getting the Building Act upgraded or having the rules that were there in the draft reinserted in our plan so that at least new buildings can be built to the sort of standard we mm. expect. Yeah, thanks, Graham, for that question. Um, it's not the first time you've asked that one, is it? Oh. <laughs> um, and so, look, as I said, uh, we've, we're undertaking a, a scan of the industry plan right now, and the, the key things that we lost, um, things that really matter, and uh, we lost um, a lot of the design provisions. They were appealed by the former government. Government agencies appealed quality design provisions in the unitary plan. How, and then there's a gap there for an expletive, mad is that? <laughs> and uh, so we, w we will be going back, and now I think we, we have a different government, a government that recognises that it's just not about supply, it's about the supply of quality living environments and communities, not just dwellings, but whole of communities. And so um, the design provisions, uh, one of the things that's come up is universal access. We lost that as well. Um, 
And we've got a, a panel, a, an advisory panel at the council that's expressed concern. We had a conference recently on, late last year on universal access. I wrote, a, a myself and um, Penny Hulse wrote a letter to Minister of Local Government, um, Mahu, uh, Minister Mahuta about this and said, look, can we meet to discuss this? This is probably not something that we want to do through just another plan change at, at Auckland Council. It's a national issue. Uh, the minister wrote back and said, three ministers would like to come and see us. I think we're meeting late this week. Three ministers are coming to see us because they are all concerned about the lack of uh, universal access to public, um, public developments and, and, and private developments. Isn't that a change, you know, when you get a response back from a minister saying, hey, I'd love to come up and have a, a chat with you about this. Yes, we recognise the challenge. Can I bring Minister Cepoloni and can I bring Minister Salisa with me? That is phenomenal. So we are addressing that and so too is the government. Thanks. Um, uh, David, I'll get... A, oh, you've got the microphone. Yep, OK, go ahead. Thank you very much. Your question here oh, sorry, uh, could you press the button so it turns green? Thank you. Um, left hand button. No. Um, uh, speak really loud. I'll speak loudly. Oh, it yeah. works. It's a bit of a hey. lag. Um, Ian, it relates a little bit to what you were saying about alignments and misalignments. It relates a little bit to what you were saying, um, I think, Rachel, about uh, purpose of transport, access. Um, it also relates to issues around affordability, my question. That, you know, we, we've had reports of the costs of congestion in Auckland, yet they're not seem, they don't seem to be factored in those ex externalities, don't seem to be factored into the business cases for making the changes that we all know what we need to make, but we find them so hard to make. So is this a failure of our sort of, you know, sort of just an unsophisticated view of how we manage our money? And Chris, maybe your point that you just made is a, a sort of a hint to, the, to, to, to how we might get around that. I think just very briefly, I'll, and I'll pass on, but I think climate risk and is actually mediated through political risk. And, and that's where we've seen it suffering, is that you're starting to see that this is quite a risky business. So part of the, the message I like to say is, is why should it be so risky? What can central government do to back up people to make the kind of decisions? And it's partly around how we count things. So you know, the, the, we don't count things like walkability, we don't count other forms of things with our models. And when you get to a business case and it goes all the way through, you know, we're talking about the power of numbers over the power of values. And I think that's the shift which you need to get. We need to have a value-driven system first, and the numbers should back that up. Uh, so, oh, Rachel, did you? Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. So I just wanted to add to that. Um, so we, when we do economics, um, ca calculate economics for transport projects, as you say, decongestion is a huge part of what we're valuing and what we place value on. We do incorporate the cost of carbon emissions. We incorporate the benefits of getting people walking more or the disbenefits of people walking less. But those things seem to be really undervalued. And we're also we're not great at taking into account the wider social benefits of doing things like giving people better access. We, we don't take into account things like creating better access in communities that are underserved and that are car dependent. We, we treat them equally as people who already have really good transport access. And so we, well, we do value some of those things, but we're not valuing them in the right way and we're not valuing them enough. And that really needs to change. Thank you. Um, and another question uh, from the floor? I'm gonna ask one, oh, oh sorry, microphone. Oh, so there you go. Here comes my, and then, thanks. Just make sure I push that button all right. Um, I guess just kind of relating to everything that everyone's said on the panel so far, I mean, taking it that we understand all the comments that have been made, um, how come we aren't sort of mad as redirecting all of our funding towards these um, non-car dependent uh, connected networks. So if we've got micro-mobility becoming more popular and it's got low emissions, and we do have some public transport, and we could, um, I mean, why don't we 
ensure we're getting people that first mile, last mile, and an ability that they could walk or micro mobility to public transport. Why we know that there's enough road space if we reallocated it in a different way. Um, I guess why, yeah, just why aren't we doing that? Free, free choice here. Um, Shane looks the most eager. <laughs> this might be relative. <laughs> I think I understood the question. Um, I think the question is why aren't we, just correct me if I'm wrong, why aren't we doing more public transport and active modes and micro mobility? Is that? Um, that is the, so, there's a lot in that question. Um, uh, that is the intention with the Greenfields developments, with, renew, uh, with uh, the redevelopment of Brownfields areas in terms of that. Uh, we are currently in the process of, uh, we, we have the ATCOP manual, I guess, at the moment, which is being transferred to the Transport Design Manual. And the intention is that where you are in the city will support the policy outcomes that council is trying to achieve and that central government is trying to achieve. Um, obviously, uh, we have something like 28 billion being invested in transport in the next 10 years, uh, 10 billion in uh, operations and maintenance and the rest in capital. Um, it's it's going to take time over the next 10 years to get there, but that that's the intention. Uh, yes, thanks, Ian. I mean, just... Um very quick point. One of the one of the truisms we have in plan is that the the value of a vision is in its budget, not in its aspiration. So you, you really need to look at the budget. And is that budget sufficient to get the level of transformation which we've all talked about today? This is radical change. Is this a radical budget? Is it radically different than what happened ten years ago? And those are the questions where I, I'm sure lots of we all sort of agree, but this is where we have to help Chris. And, and, and vote the right ways and make sure our message is out there that actually the status quo that we have now, we're not happy with that. We want a slightly different one. And th we want the status quo to be the risky space rather than the innovation to be the risky space. And how do we get there and allow our budgets to be realigned to our new vision? And just following up on that, I think 18 months, go back 18 months, we've actually come a long way in 18 months. Massive step change but it needs to be an even bigger step change than that, and that's what you're saying. So, uh, you look, we're, we're looking at a light rail system to enliven the whole Isthmus area, to, to enable development to take place there, to create homes and communities on the Isthmus. It's not about going to the airport on the light rail, forget it. There's other, the, it can go to the airport, but we'll be accessing the airport through the, 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 the heavy gauge rail with a brand new station at Puanui, transferring on bus priority, um, which in time will become light rail as well. But when you look at 18 months ago, we had a project called the East-West Link. Remember that one? It was about $1.8 billion, which had, if it had a business case, it was about that thin. And we've got rid of that. And there will be, there will be an East-West Link, but the government are in us indicating that it's going to be a, a much reduced project. Um, but now, 18 months on, you've got the new East-West Link equivalent popping up, and that's Mill Road. Mill Road is a $1 billion road that some people are proposing to be four lanes from the back of Readout Road, Manurewa, Papakura, going east of those uh, town centres, wrapping all the way through to Drury, wrapping all the way through to Pukekohe. If that road goes in before we commit to uh, third tracking, electrification, new stations at Drury, to provide for that whole growth area, you will have 30 years of car dependency at least. So that's the challenge for us. We, we are getting, we've got the, the industry or some from the industry knocking on the door saying, please spend a billion dollars plus on a mill road. We need it now for all these reasons. And it's, we're just back to where we were on the east-west link. We need to head these things off and put transit first. Thank you. Um, a microphone is where? Oh, um, okay. 
Thanks. Uh, I'll come over here first and then Sarah afterwards. Thank you. Go. Um, hi. I guess I'm a little bit interested in finding out what you think about um, the impact of a four-year electoral cycle on having good science um, and good kind of knowledge and expertise being actioned in terms of big ideas like this. Because I think um, if you have things like talking about the last government made this you know, bad call on something or other and now the new ones come, it feels like the reset button each time and therefore it's a kind of, not an excuse, but perhaps a kind of perpetuator of the inertia on good ideas and good actions being able to happen. Kia ora, Sybil. Um, so I guess just talking about um, the ideas. We're in this mess because we're using the same ideas. And that tends to be Western science, which is isolated. And I think this is an opportunity where te ao Māori can really shape the future of what it looks like. Um, but why aren't we doing that? So we already know all of this. You guys have been talking, you know, same corridor for your guys' generation, you know? So we're still using the same ideas, the same values, and there's an opportunity for us to really shape and change that. Um, but, but um, yeah, why aren't we doing that? Do you guys know? <laughs> Look, I think um, that's a really good question. So, well, thank you. So, uh, the four-year four election cycle has been looked at by a few governments. Uh, they are very, very reluctant. Um, they do their own private polling and they go, oh, no, the electorate doesn't like that, so we'll walk away from it. But it does need to be looked at because, really, in, in government, central or local, you, you spend a year finding out, well, wh where am I and what did the previous lot do and uh, what do I need to do? And then you get about... You might get a year uh, landing your big plan in the middle and you're underway, and next thing, you're getting ready for an election. Four years, I, I am an advocate for four years, and I think we need to start thinking about that in a bit more detail. But I would say there's a bigger problem too. I think the whole structure of uh, government and government departments and local government uh, have... They don't suit this time. They're very hierarchical, they're vertical, they're not agile, they're not dynamic. Um, you compare them with, say, a... That's, it's different, but you, you compare that structure with uh, a s very successful, nimble companies, you know, your Apple equivalents, and there are many, they're, they're flat structures. Um, the hierarchical structure is not inclusive, that was discussed by panellists here earlier. Um, they don't have tikanga about them, uh, they're combative. That's the whole structure needs to be looked at, not just the um, three-year or four-year cycle. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Look, um, Sarah, I'm afraid I'm not going to give you a chance to ask your question because it's almost time now and we've only got a short time for afternoon tea. Uh, so, uh, first of all, a very big thank you to Ian, to, um, to Chris, to Jacqueline, to uh, Rachel and to um, Shane, please, for their contributions to this uh, land transport discussion. Thank you. Um, Afternoon tea's out there. We're going to be back here in 20 minutes for the last session. So enjoy your afternoon tea and see you soon. Thanks. Um. <laughs>